Welcome to another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. I know we want to get into the action, but I have to ask that you help me armor us up a bit for the bumpy road ahead. Because I bring you the first hour of this show without unrelated ad nonsense as a proof of concept. And if you value it, then come over to THC Plus for the $8 a month and hear the full two-hour interviews as they were designed to be and as you would enjoy them most. Go to thehiresidechats.com or just click the link in the show notes to get started and within a minute you'll be plugging in your new Plus Show RSS feed into a hopefully decentralized podcasting 2.0 supported app. Feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go and we will reach the promised land. Think about that and enjoy the show. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, quickly trying to get my seat and tray table in the upright locked position as we are clearly making our descent. The late night clowns tell more tired Trump jokes and do synchronized syringe dances as the daytime talking heads tell you to ignore the turbulence and the obvious smell of smoke. Just trust your pilot. They have everything under control. What I wonder is who is this pilot anyway, and are they even from this plane? Well, as we nosedive deeper into the darkness of a biosurveillance superstructure, billionaire space dicks disappoint whatever's on the other end of their cosmic courtship, and the woke party sucks all the fun out of what's left of this ride, we can all see the writing on the wall, but we need a little more help reading it, because the signs and symbols injected into everything remain multi-layered and seeded from some weird Babylonian cult that wasn't even in the brochure. So we go to the mystics, or better yet, the synchro mystics, like master of his craft, Chris Knowles, to help us stay calm or at least aware of what's going on in these highly charged times. Because my brown paper bag is about to pop, people, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Chris is joining us for the 10th time on THC, and we have talked about everything from MKUltra, aliens, archons, award shows, architecture, pop culture, and military intelligence... To superheroes, sorcery, sirens, saucers, psyops, and pretty much everything in between. You know him as the headmaster of the Secret Sun Institute for Advanced Synchro Mysticism and as the author of great books like Our Gods Wear Spandex, The Secret History of Comic Book Heroes, The Secret History of Rock and Roll, The Mysterious Roots of Modern Music, his novel He Will Live Up in the Sky, and The Endless American Midnight, Dispatches from the Secret Sun, a great collection of his best essays from the blog, now out with a new revised and expanded edition. Well, audience and astronauts alike, no one is going anywhere, so let's get into it. One of my favorite mystics of this techno-gnostic, biosurveillance, woke-infected timeline, the mystically-minded professor of pattern recognition, woke virus vanquisher, and color commentator of the apocalypse. Chris, welcome back for lucky number 10. Oh my god, that was like the most amazing intro I've ever heard in my life. For anybody. <laughs> <laughs> too kind, too kind. It is hard to stay creative with the intro of the 10th time we've done this, but it's always great to check in with you, especially at the end of a year to go over some of the symbols and weird ritual events we've seen. The last time we talked was back in March, and pretty much everything seems more intense, more aggressive, more insane. What are your thoughts on where we are on this weird path to owning nothing and never being happier in the metaverse? Well, everything is just more and more in your face all the time. Whoever is actually orchestrating a lot of these things that we talk about seems to not be worried about any kind of recrimination or consequences and is just putting the pedal to the metal and letting it go. I mean, it seems to be no stop in this train now. And like I've said, and like I've detailed so much on the blog over this past year, things are getting more and more explicit and stranger. And more and more along the lines of things that I've been talking about for a long time, that 
people sort of like, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, what is this? Mm-hmm. What is this Mithras thing? I don't know what that is. You know, I mean, all these sort of things that I was pointing at for a long time, and they're just becoming more and more obvious. And we start to see like these grotesques being installed, such as, well, the news today is at the UN, they have that winged jaguar that looks like a ayahuasca nightmare. Um, <laughs> we have the We Come in Peace, that grotesque monster, alien demon that was on the roof of the, the Met during the Met Gala a couple years ago, and now is installed in the National Mall of all places. We have the Medusa installed at the courtroom in New York that we've talked about before, and now we have the Squid Lady in Dallas, not too far from Dealey Plaza, and the giant Lucifer statue at AT AT&T. So things are getting very open, you know? What was once hidden is now becoming revealed. Yes, yes. As you say, it's full steam ahead, full court press, and... It does kind of seem rushed to me. Like the tech isn't ready. The sales pitch isn't even very good. It's so heavy handed that even the non-suspicious seem like they're getting a little suspicious. So that's a silver lining. But man, I've heard you say recently that the world is not run by science. It's run by sorcery. And you've been using the term sorcerarchy, which I like. Always love a good term. But elaborate a little more on this sorcery behind the science for for people who still don't see it. Because the conspiracy world, as you often criticize, is not focused on this thread. And it's the thread that I love to focus on when you're here. Well, yes. There's a line of thinking in the conspiracy world that I find very irritating. And that, you know, there's super science being hidden and the super science being worked. And these people have the powers of gods. and you know, transhumanism is in full bloom and everything. I always think that, like, if transhumanism is really working, like, why do people like Bill Gates and George Soros look like dried up raisins? You know, um, (laughs) you figure (laughs) there would be some kind of technology to make them look a little less decrepit. But, you know, this is one of the things I've talked about repeatedly is that so much of this nonsense, this super science nonsense that was being fed into the media was coming from Mr. Jeffrey Epstein. You know, it was a huge booster of transhumanism and science fiction science. And, you know, he wanted his dick to be cryogenically frozen so he could repopulate the earth and so on. And then, you know, as soon as he died, I mean, all that stuff just dropped out of the popular science press overnight. It's really amazing. Especially when I look back like 2018 or so and seeing all the stuff just being thrown at us night and day. I mean, I have a different take, having studied this stuff for a long time. I mean, I have a supernatural worldview. I see the world kind of like a theater for supernatural forces that rule over us and control the controllers, so to speak. And the technology and super technology, I call it the plumbing. It's just basically the plumbing. It's basically the wiring. It's a delivery system. And I think one of the things when you talk about like this whole feeling that things are being rushed and being done like very half acidly, I think one of the problems is, is that these people, you know, that sort of that Davos level, that World Economic Forum level, you know, they're smart in some ways, you know, maybe they're good at math or whatever, but, you know, they're not scientists and they don't understand that, you know, they're throwing money at these scientists and the scientists are throwing bullshit back at them in return. And they believed all the nonsense that was being fed, like AI and, you know, robotics and Skynet and the Matrix and just all the science fiction stuff. And now that they're trying to launch their great reset, so to speak, they're realizing that none of this stuff is actually working the way that they were told it was going to work. You know, they were sold a bill of goods by the people that they've been just throwing billions of dollars at because technology basically has stopped. You know, I mean, the rate of technological improvement or development has been near zero for quite some time. We don't have the powers that you're told that we do as far as computing power. I mean, the laws of physics drastically limit computations 
and you know we hear things about quantum computing and all this kind of stuff and that's just more hype that's just more of the hype machine one thing that i'd like you know your listeners to really be aware of is that when they're reading this stuff about the science fiction comic book stuff that's allegedly out there a lot of it is just bullshit to get grant money and to get vc money you know venture capital money and that the actual science that's available is much less than we're led to believe. And actually the science that we do have, the technology that we do have, can't do what we're told it can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you are pretty unique on your take with that. And I see a lot of the signs when you connect those dots and you write about it, it definitely seems very much accurate. And when it comes to what this secret sorcery cult is or the sorcerarchy, You've been very critical of those who call it Satanism or Luciferianism. We have others who call it a Saturn death cult, but you are more inclined to say at its core that it's a Mithraic cult. And we've talked about Mithras being the true hidden figure that is the Statue of Liberty and is behind that statue at Rockefeller Center. But when you dig more into the signs and symbols of Mithras, here are just some interesting various quotes from some reading I was doing. But we have... One of the most characteristic and poorly understood features of the mysteries is the naked lion-headed figure often found in Mithraic temples. Well, that makes me think of MGM, which comes up a few key times and key places in your work. Mm-hmm. And then it goes on mobile too. Yeah. 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 The Pegasus. Uh, and then it goes on to say his body is a naked man's entwined by a serpent or two serpents like a caduceus. Well, that's certainly in play these days. Mithraism was much more complicated than the various state cults of the sun and seems to share some cosmological features with Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. Recent scholarship has suggested that astrology and astronomy offer keys to the Mithraic mystery. Well, we see that everywhere. In the iconography, Mithras both represents the sun and is set against it. He appears banqueting with the sun, shaking hands with him or crowning him, for instance, One plausible explanation of this is that he represents Saturn, the star of the sun to many ancient astrologers. Babylonian astrology seems to have seen Saturn as the sun of the night as opposed to the sun of the day. This is why Mithras and the sun can be seen as equivalent. However, since the top Mithraic initiation grade corresponds to Saturn while the sun comes second, it is clear that Mithras can be portrayed as superior to the sun. So... A lot of stuff there, but it seems that you can fold the light bearer symbolism and the Saturnian symbolism and the astrological correspondences all under the umbrella of a Mithraic cult. It seems like a really good target for the top demonic dog here. Well, I'm going to amend some of that that's been written. Mithras is Perseus, okay? So Mithraism is actually an invented religion. It was invented... Scholars now believe that it was invented in Rome and not by Cilician pirates in Turkey. It was specifically invented for a purpose. It was invented to push forward the empire, the interests of the empire, enlisting soldiers and alpha male types and so on. I would argue, so Saturn is poorly understood. People have a lot of explanations why Saturn is important. But they neglect to point out the fact that in the ancient world, when Mithraism was being developed, Saturn was the outermost planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Saturn is the gateway to the stars because the whole idea, and, you know, we see this, for instance, in the Great Pyramid, right? Like the shafts pointing at Orion and Sirius. The point was to escape time and your soul wanted to travel into the stars, okay? So Saturn would be the gateway. And the reason why Mithras is important is that if you look at a star map, you'll see that Mithras is rising above the ecliptic, okay? And the ecliptic is where the sun rises, and that gives us the zodiac, you know, and the signs of the zodiac that gives us astrology, right? So Perseus is rising above the Zodiac, which means he's escaping time, and he's escaping the gods, and he's escaping the archons, okay, which is the planetary influences. So he's rising above that and ascending into heaven, and heaven is the northern 
part of the celestial sphere, and that's where Cepheus is, and Cepheus is the gardener, which gives us the Garden of Eden and so on. So Mithras escapes the bounds of time, and that's why we have, you know, that lion-headed figure represents eternity and timeless time. You know, you're escaping the bounds of temporality. You're becoming immortal. You know, your soul is becoming immortal in the stars. So that's really the basis of this symbolism, you know. So Saturn is the gateway to escape the influence of the archons and head out into the freedom of the stars, and so to speak. And Perseus, a.k.a. Mithras, is rising up the Milky Way to the garden. You know, he's returning to the garden. And that's why this symbolism was so potent, and I think remains potent, because Perseus is an interesting figure in that Perseus gained his power through technology, essentially. He was given power from the gods. You know, he was giving tools to carry out his missions. You know, this makes him unique among these ancient heroes because he had a number, he had an entire arsenal of them. You know, you talk about Pegasus. Pegasus was given to by the gods. Uh, you know, his helmet was given to by the gods, his shield, and so on and so forth. So I think that when Mithraism was revived in the mid-19th century, it was during the Industrial Revolution, when technology was very much of primary interest, you know, it was primary interest to, you know, basically the Masonic ruling structure, you know, particularly in Britain and France and so on. So this is why I think that this symbol that was laid dormant for quite some time was kind of revived. And that's why, you know, you had mentioned uh, Statue of Liberty and Prometheus and then the, the famous Lucifer at AT&T. And, you know, there's just a number of these kind of things. I mean, one of the things that I recently found out that just absolutely blew my mind is that Mithras's cap is on the official seal of the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So right, it's just the like, Smurfs cap for people who don't have the visual. In mind. Yes, yes. And that was given to all these figures like Lady Liberty and so on in the 19th century. So this symbolism has been seeded into the public consciousness for quite some time. And it is, again, it's a technological dream. It's a technological fantasy of achieving immortality through technology. And this ties back to, the, you know, all the work that I've done with Lucifer's Technologies, you know, because Lucifer's Technologies is going to focus on AT&T, right? And the Bell System, and we've discussed this before. Well, their symbol for quite some time, and, and AT&T's recovered the symbol, is that giant golden statue of Phanus, and Phanus is just the Greek name for Lucifer, and the Phanus icon was very popular with Mithraeus. So a lot of what we're seeing here is very old, but it's been recreated, let's just say, to suit the technocracy and the higher levels of the technocracy. And I think that that's what it all feeds into. But it's all about escaping mortality. You know, it's all about escaping the restrictions of humanity, hence transhumanism, right? And hence trans this and trans that, you know, trans gender, trans species. And that's why we see a lot of these Mithraic icons being trans, you know, for instance, the Statue of Liberty and also the trans famous at the Jesuit University of St. Louis. So right. the, that stands right at the gate. So yes, it's a big, complicated story. But like, I mean, it's gotten so when I talk about how just shameless this has gotten, I mean, we have Bloomberg put a Mithraic temple in his headquarters in London. Okay, so he took a Mithraic temple that had been like a few blocks away and moved it into this building. And actually, one of my patrons had went down there and they've really sort of, you know, it's basically you go down to that thing and you're basically initiated now, you know, they've yeah. created this whole kind of experience. So, yeah, this stuff is everywhere. And it's it all speaks to this technocratic, you know, what I call Lucifer's technologies dream. And I think that the people who are driving this don't realize 
and I don't think they fully understand the spiritual forces that are manipulating them. You know, because we talked about in the previous show, we talked about the ultra terrestrials and so on, right? And that influence. So it is a big, complex story, and I, I know a lot of people are going to have trouble with it. But the way I came to this conclusion after many years is just seeing these just massive public rituals constantly and the symbolism getting just more and more pointed, more and more explicit. And I just stood back and I said, all right, wait a second. Why are they doing this? What is the point of this? What are they accomplishing? And I realized, well, they're doing it and they've been doing this stuff, you know, more and more explicitly since the turn of millennium because this stuff works. It works for them. And why does it work for them? Well, it works for them because the people they're calling are picking up the phone. You know? <laughs> the people on the other end are picking up the phone and, and, and getting the message. So, you know, this is something I, I wouldn't have understood until I really started studying ritual magic and so on and the grimoires and how all that stuff worked. Right. So people don't go to this kind of lengths to do these things if they're not getting something out of it. They just don't. Yes, I totally agree with you. And it is important to identify that overarching entity that all these things speak to. But I am still curious, and I always obsess over this, but how do you think the technocracy views its relationship with Mithras? Is it just worshiping and venerating Mithras for power and control, making a Faustian bargain for escapism? Obviously, they think this is a real power or they wouldn't waste their time. You use the phone analogy, but it's like, are they communing, do you think? Are they possessed? How do they view their relationship with this entity? I think that Mithras is more like, at most, it's a tulpa, okay? I think Mithras is an archetype and is seen as an archetype because I think the ultimate you know, we talk about the ultra terrestrials. What I've seen as I've been looking at this stuff for almost 30 years now is that the ultimate object of veneration seems to be the watchers that we read about in Enoch. And if you actually, if you read the Mithraic liturgy from the PGM, it's astonishingly reminiscent of the things that you'll read about in First Enoch, okay? This seems to be a great deal of similarity in the depiction, you know, being taken up into the heavens, which just sounds like a spaceship, right? So I think that the actual objects of ultimate veneration are the Watchers, and that's when we start to come in with all this Nephilim stuff. Yeah. And I think that all the lesser gods, so, you know, maybe Mithras is seen as you know, one of the men of renown, the old gods, the old heroes, which would be these extra ultra terrestrial trans dimensional entities somehow interacting with humanity and creating like a new race. And I, I think that's, you know, we see this all the time. We see this kind of symbolism all the time. I mean, recently I was talking about Lovecraft, you know, and how Lovecraft's old ones remind me very much of like the watchers imprisoned in the abyss, okay? So I think that what this all points to, as far as my understanding is, is somehow piercing this veil that will allow what the author of Enoch called the watchers, many names, you know, old ones in this whole Lovecraftian thing, which is all taken from Alice Bailey, and she had this whole thing with the Grand White Lodge on Sirius and so on and so forth. So I think that the ultimate goal, and I mean, even Crowley talks about this. I think Crowley sort of like said the quiet part out loud, right? When he said that, you know, humanity's only hope is to contact these extra dimensional beings. He didn't use that exact term, but he said, you know, our only hope is to contact these extraterrestrials, ultra terrestrials and somehow commune with them. That will be our salvation. And I think that, I don't think Crowley is just like 
talking out of his hat. I think that this is very much part of the esoteric tradition. And I think if you look back and if you start to take, you know, when you look at all like the names of the gods and their, their roles and stuff, I mean, that's all like culturally fixated, right? Because first of all, a lot of the names are just titles, right? So the titles of the gods and the stories and the myths and so on are all contingent upon the culture that they exist within. But I think ultimately, they're all sort of describing the same reality. And the thing that I've been more and more fixated on is this whole idea of the signal. There's a signal coming into our reality that we're picking up on. And people read it in different ways. And that's how they come up with these various pantheons and these various descriptions of these various gods and so on and so forth. I mean, they're picking up on the same signal and the same, almost like the same kind of impulses, but they're using their own language and their own culture to define it. Mm -hmm. I agree. And in terms of examples of some of this stuff in the last year, I wanted to, I guess, just run through some of my notes here on giants and squids. But in terms of the Nephilim, Giant symbolism has been huge lately. You've pointed out a lot of examples. Travis Scott appeared as a giant in his Fortnite concert. A sculpture called Water's Soul of a Giant Head, Shushin, is installed now on the banks of the Hudson in New Jersey. And you captured a headline about a giant statue that's going to be doing a tour of 21 cities around the world for some reason. And there is a story that you captured the headline four that said Syrian children have faced war and famine a giant puppet named little Amel is telling their story so that's all strange and in terms of the squid this is another example of replacing old statues with new ones there's this squid headed statue in Dallas you mentioned earlier that was put up after a confederate statue was taken down and in the cultural zeitgeist squid game was clearly the most popular show this year and as I learned from your blog in the 2019 Super Bowl halftime show, when Travis Scott came crashing down from the heavens on a meteor, he was introduced by Squidward from SpongeBob, or as you call him, Squidward Thulu. But this is a, a weird squid motif and a, a weird giant motif. And clearly it's uh, very potent this past year. Well, when you talk about the cephalopods too, I mean, remember Arrival? Mm, yeah. You know, the movie with Amy Adams sure. and Jeremy Renner and, you know, the sort of synchro mystic cephalopods that can change time through language. Yeah, it seems to be a bit of a pattern, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, this is why the Lovecraft kind of material is still relevant to my mind and why I had reposted. Well, I actually did a, a huge revision and, and it was basically sort of a white paper on that whole Alice Bailey Lovecraft connection. Right. And, and how, you know, it was very clear to me that he was either reading her material or the material was being fed to him through Hoffman Price. So, yeah, I mean, this is what I'm saying. When these things just repeat over and over and over again, you just start to think, well, yeah, I think there's something there. And, you you know, we're always, you know, periodic will always see articles and like sort of borderline science sites like octopuses are, are actually aliens and so on. I mean, just do octopus and alien. You'll get like a million hits on that. Right. But, you know, you talked about Travis Scott. That whole thing with Squidward and, you know, that whole Super Bowl. crashing to Earth like a fallen angel. But, you know, that was with Maroon 5, right? And Adam Levine, I don't know if you've ever seen, but he has a giant mermaid on the back of his back. You right, know, a giant a siren. Tattoo, right? Yes, a giant siren. And, and, you know, if you read Enoch, it says that the women who became the wives of the angels who fell, like the fallen angels, became sirens. So that's like some pretty specific connections there. Yes. And also, also the person <laughs> who produces these events and produced that event in question is the guy who was involved in the production of the Millennium Dome show that we've discussed before. So it's very interesting to me that 
I've said that the Millennium Dome show was kind of like beta testing for a lot of these big, giant, public rituals that mm -hmm. we've talked about. And it's how interesting that it's that guy, a guy named Hamish Hamilton, who worked for another guy named Mark Fisher, which is, I love that name, you know, Fish, you know, mm -hmm. Mark Fisher, right? Martian Fisher, right? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so it doesn't really take a lot of digging to just realize that what seems random and chaotic is actually specific and involves a relatively small group of people. Right, right. The name sinks are always so interesting because it's like, was this a person's destiny? Is this kind of aligned with their astrology? Is anything real? Are these all just actors? I mean, I even learned from your blog that Fauci means sickle, which is a symbol Kronos representations are holding quite often. Just another example of how it really is everywhere. But not to get you know, too off script. Let's talk about the Astro World Travis Scott thing because it also relates big time to the work you did on the Harvest Festival and has some Liz Frazier sinks, doesn't it? Yeah. Why wouldn't it? Like, why wouldn't, like, you know, this 20 something year old rapper in 2021 not have something to do with, like, this semi obscure dream pop diva from, you know, the 80s? Right. You know? It, just, it just goes without saying. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> So, of course, Liz Frazier is Scottish, and in 2005 sang on an album called La Traverse, which in English and French means a place name that describes a person who lives near a bridge or a fjord. And, of course, Jeff Buckley died in the river, bridge being invoked. And well, this... you, you, you're missing the lead here. I mean, it's like Traverse is French for Travis. Right. I mean, the name Travis is derived from that word. Yeah, note, as it says in my notes, uh, note the meaning is to cross. So yes. as in cross dimensional gateways and yes. the symbolism was all over that concert too. And remember Nibiru, right? The whole thing with Nibiru is the planet of crossing. So hmm. crossing over, crossing the threshold, crossing the bridge, crossing the dimensional divide, let's just say, you know. Yes, and there was a lot of weird portal symbolism to that show. Mm -hmm. It is hard without the visual sometimes, but even just going into his mouth in the same way that invoked that piece of artwork, just the name, Astro World. I mean, it's right there, heaven and earth. Yes, yes, Astro World, heaven or Las Vegas, right? Yeah. <laughs> it sort of completes the circuit. Yeah, I was really stunned when. I guess it was a week and a half later, almost two weeks later, when um, Young Dolph, who's another rapper that I'd never heard of, was shot in Memphis, and he was killed on Jeff Buckley's birthday. Yeah. So that really, it almost like completed a circuit, because we talked on your show, and you, and you actually had turned me on to this, this whole thing with Little Peep, you know, Little Peep, the shepherd boy, so on and so forth, dying a month after las vegas so you know we you know two music festivals both very very heavily heavily laden with symbolism that anybody can recognize i mean you don't have to be like a semiotician to spot that and it, interestingly enough i mean you had that whole what i call Knowles's first law where it's whenever there's a controversy in the media about symbolism it's usually disguising another symbolic message altogether right so I looked at Astro World. I'm like, yeah, the mountain, that's Mount Hermon. That's where the watchers come down. And then, he, you know, that shirt he's wearing where, like, the red figures walk through the portal and they become the blue figures, right? I mean, that's the imprisoned watchers or the ultra-terrestrials or however you choose to name them walking through the portal into our world, right? And then in the center of the mountain, you have those rings, and that's, like, the whole the ringed portal. You know, there are certain versions of the story where the watches were imprisoned at Mount Hermon. And then the cross, the crossing, the planet of crossing, crossing the gateway, and then, of course, the name. And Travis Scott's not his real name, right? <laughs> he just, did he just pick that out of a hat? I don't know. It's like yeah, kind of strange. Probably assigned. I can't really look at him and say, like, that's like the guy 
coming up with all the symbolism. I, I doubt very much that it is. Drake is involved in this, and Drake seems to be like probably a little more savvy symbolically. He's got the whole thing with the owl and the ovo, and the ovo, of course, ties back to the Millennium Dome show, right? Yes, yes. I actually wanted to just let me read this from my notes because this is taken straight from your blog where you say, Drake, singer and entrepreneur, was Scott's partner in the Astroworld debacle. Looks like both of them are about to make their attorneys wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, but that's not a secret sun problem. However, Drake also owns a chain of boutiques called Ovo, short for October's very own, whatever that means. Maybe he's referring to the Orionids, the October meteor showers, the ancients associated with the fallen ones. Ovo is also the title of the soundtrack to the Millennium Dome show. The Ovos in question are those of the character sung by Liz Frazier, who becomes the mitochondrial Eve of a new race of human alien hybrids or human fallen angel hybrids, whichever you prefer. And whether you realize it or not, the people who created the Millennium Dome show are the same people who created the kind of mass open air rituals we take for granted at stadium concerts and games these days, including Astroworld. And I also took down that the Millennium Dome had a giant installed in it and a womb room and an animated film of a human sperm's race for life as one of its attractions. I mean, they're laying it on pretty thick. You know, if you understand the origin of the symbolism, it's not really too hard to put two and two together. I have to say that I, I haven't done my due diligence here because I should have looked into who produced the Astro World, particularly this year, is because I do wonder if it was somebody in that Hamish Hamilton, Mark Fisher orbit. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was because, you know, as I've said before, they invented this whole thing. You know, they invented this thing in the night. I think the first thing was Zuropa. You know, I think the first show was Zuropa or maybe it was the Rolling Stones. But, you know, when we started seeing these big stadium shows with these huge production values, that was this group. And then they started in with the Super Bowls, I think the first one they did was the one with Phil Collins. No, I'm sorry, that was Julie Taymor. But, you know, they started doing the Super Bowls and stuff. So when we start seeing this very pointed and very specific symbolism show up, it's not just floating in out of the ether. It's not like the collective unconscious or something. It's people who have an understanding of this stuff and have done it before. So again, like there was this whole like satanic panic and everything like that. And like, this is Satanism and stuff. And it's just like, you know, are we still at that point? Are we still that dumb? You know, can we like look at the symbolism a little more specifically? Because, you know, to my mind, this is a lot scarier than Satanism. You know? <laughs> Satanism is like sex pests and, and rich weirdos, you know, or rich sex pests and not rich weirdos. I mean, you know, Satanism is just basically for weirdos and losers and perverts, you know. It's not something that is held to the bosom of the upper echelons, let's just say. I mean, you can describe it as satanic, you know, with a small s, you know, it's an opposition and where my reading of Satan is that it represents the Roman Empire and the people who collaborate with them, you know, their Quislings and so on, particularly in the New Testament. But First of all, there really isn't a lot of, like, satanic lore to follow. I mean, Satan just sort of pops up in the Bible as just like this opposing figure. And if you really want to get specific about it, you know, you're going to get into, like, the grimoires and stuff. But the grimoires are all just rewrites of Babylonian demonology that came to light during the Crusades and so on. So there really isn't, like, actual satanic lore to follow. You know, unless you're talking about idiots like Anton LaVey or something. I mean, it's just, there's nothing there. You right. know what I mean? But if you're talking about like the Watchers and the Nephilim and on and on and on, and how you would start to tie in all these other myth systems into that, you know, also from Babylonia, Sumer, Assyria, on and on and on, then you start to have something that starts to look a little more systematic yes a little more organized and not just like let's just hang the cross upside down while we <laughs> you know rape this girl with a crucifix or something you know it's just like this absolute ridiculous nonsense that you'd see in like heavy metal videos from the 80s or something right it seems to go much deeper in this watcher mithraic lore is a lot richer 
And it seems like the oldest story we have is this weird nexus of otherworldly entities and humans and hybrids and corrupting human DNA. And those are very much themes of the big agenda these days. It's about as crazy as could possibly be with the uh, stuff going on. And it seems like they're playing the trump card. Like, they are playing this card, and there won't be much left if they don't accomplish it or on the other side of it. But another weird event this year was the Egyptian Parade of 22 Mummies. <laughs> you covered this on the vlog a couple of times. One in a post called Smells Like Freem Spirit, which I like because we have Freemasonic overtones. And these mummies died in Luxor, hitting on that theme again. But to wrap a big synchromystic ribbon around a lot of this stuff so far, you write... The one-two punch of Astroworld and the death of young Dolph was followed by the parade of the 22 pharaohs in Luxor, which itself followed on 22 men being condemned to death that very morning by the Egyptian government. In the midst of this, the Pentagon just created a new UFO office to replace the old ATIP office. Also in the midst of all this is the same siren and shepherd boy symbolism that led up to and included those events at the Highway 91 Festival in 2017, just next door to the Luxor Hotel and Casino. Those events followed on the death of Chris Cornell at the MGM Grand in Detroit and were followed in turn by the deaths of Lincoln Park's Chester Bennington and emo rapper Little Peep, all of which were heavily laden with shepherd boy symbolism. In the midst of that was the 923-17 Syzergy in Virgo and Leo associated with the Book of Revelation and following it was the announcement of the To the Stars Academy, an amorphous outfit set up by former Blink-182 singer Tom DeLong to study UFOs. Deadly festivals, dead rappers, Luxor UFOs. Anyone see a pattern here? As you say, very wild stuff. And the fact that young Dolph died on jeff buckley's birthday and also in 1997 there was a 60 person massacre at a temple in luxor egypt on that same day november 17th the same day jeff buckley's birthday young dolph's death day this massacre day in luxor egypt and of course we didn't say this but young dolph had an album called king of memphis where he eventually died and his last depiction in a music video was him underwater which is how jeff buckley died in that same location it's crazy man now you know why i became insane <laughs> now you know, it's just like yeah, I, like, yeah. like why i just like popped a cork in like sort of a lovecraftian narrator's manner you know because <laughs> it's just like i'm gonna add another thing another log to the fire there the new ufo desk that was announced in the wake of Astral World, was shepherded, no pun intended, by Kristen Gillibrand, a senator of New York, whose father was part of Nexium. Oh, shit. Yeah, so there's a Nexium tie-in there, and, and there's Nexium tie-ins to Mexico and sex trafficking, and there are Nexium tie-ins to Epstein, and we have Ghislaine on trial now, and Ghislaine has the connections to Jack Parsons. <laughs> right. Tell us about that connection. I heard you mention that recently on another podcast, but that is an interesting connection. Okay, so didn't I talk about this on your show? I thought I did. Well, you um, know, I smoke a lot, so it's possible. <laughs> there goes the short-term memory, man. Right. <laughs> okay, so Ghislaine's sister... Christine Maxwell is married to Frank Molina, who is the son of Ed Molina, who is Jack Parsons' partner in Jet Propulsion Laboratories. So there you go. Yeah, it's a small world. Yeah. Well, you know, another thing I want to tie in when we start talking about Jack Parsons was the connections with Altamont. And Altamont, you know, brings Kenneth Grant into the story, and Kenneth Grant brings, you know, his patrons, the Getty family, into the story. And the Gettys, Ivy Getty, had a big wedding, you know, in the midst of all this madness. I think the weekend after Astro World, and um, 
Earth, Wind, and Fire played at her wedding reception, and Earth, Wind, and Fire also played at Astro World. And just in case that isn't insane enough, <laughs> she had requested that in lieu of gifts, that donations be made to Best Friends Animal Society, which is the organization that grew out of the processed church of the final judgment. Jeez. Okay. And the day before that, the Empire State Building was lit up in red and it looked very, very demonic, ostensibly in honor of the Clifford the Big Red Dog movie. But the lighting was sponsored by the Best Friends Animal Society. So <laughs> why are they connected to the Getty family and to the Empire State Building on 33rd Street, by the way? I, I mean, I worked in that building for a number of years. What's going on there? Yeah. It's just absolutely insane. I, it's just, like I said, I mean, when you start to peel away all the distractions and the red herrings, you start to see like a very tight circle of people. So Altamont, you know, the inferences that I was making there is that Altamont means high mountain. And of course, Travis Scott had the mountain as the main stage set for Astral World, right? And Altamont had ended notoriously in terrible violence because the Hell's Angels were basically just beating people up. And I think like five or six people were killed. One person was killed on camera. So like Mountain Hell's Angels, Mountain Fallen Angels, you know, it's yeah. kind of making the connections here. But the murder that happened on film happened while the Stones were playing Sympathy for the Devil, which was a song they had written on the direction of Kenneth Anger, because Kenneth Anger had sort of insinuated himself into the Stone Circle because Kenneth Anger had a lot of money from the Gettys and the Ford Foundation. I mean, just ponder that for a moment. And actually, the Gettys and the Ford Foundation were giving him money to make Lucifer Rising, okay? Which he didn't finish till 1980 because he's Kenneth Anger and that's the way he rolls. So, Kenneth Anger connects us to the Gettys. We have the Getty wedding. Kenneth Anger also connects us to Ghislaine. Ghislaine, through a number of steps, and I'm sure we can connect them much quicker. I'm, I, I haven't looked to see Kirsten Gillibrand's connections to Ghislaine, but I'm sure they're numerous. So yeah, there's a very tight circle being drawn here. And the UFO desk being revived in the same way that we had this announcement nine days after Las Vegas for this whole TTSA thing that just was a big washout, which we've discussed before because you know, Tom DeLong <laughs> <laughs> just couldn't stick the landing. But it seems to be like this year there was like a circuit completed, like something had started, like a ball had started rolling in 2017 and was completed in 2021. Oh, and another connection, too, is that the Houston Astros were in the World Series both those years. Hmm. They were in the World Series in 2017 and 2021. So, yeah, I got to tell you, and they played the Atlanta Braves, whose name comes from Atlantis, and Atlantis is, you know, also associated with this whole abyss, sunken civilization, you know, which we can tie into theosophy and alice bailey and also to hp lovecraft and so on yeah so it's very interesting because it seems that again if we peel away these sort of distractions and red herrings being thrown at us like satanic panic and so on you know we start to see what the messaging is and it's pretty stark you know i mean if you understand the language the message is rather clear in my mind Yes, yes. The themes are there. It's quite a tapestry and nothing seems real or genuine. Before we close this thing out, I just wanted to maybe get back to current events for a minute because you've said on the blog that this sorcerer Archie is pulling out every tool in the toolbox, you know, the shots, the attempts to link biometrics and credit scores to online behavior. And you've said, I expect it to get worse before it gets better, but you ultimately think they will fail at all this. What would you say to people to help them get through a period of time that seems quite scary until we talk again? Well, again, I have full confidence that this program is going to fail because it's stupid. 
It's based in fantasy. And it's overly complex. You know, overly complex systems fail. They really do. As far as getting through this, I mean, I have my ways, but, you know, it's going to be up to you. you not you, but, you know, people out there to sort of discover what their core is, you know, get to what their non-negotiables are. You know, what what is your core? What is your basis? You know, what is your purpose, really? But again, these plans are just, they're crazy. And they are so subject. I mean, look, we were just recording, right? And then the recording went down. I mean, just imagine, I mean, remember when Amazon went down? I think they went down again today as well. I mean, they're out for like most of the day last week. Hmm. That's a sneak preview. Because not only are we going to have like these overly complex systems failing, <laughs> But we're going to have people, probably state actors, going online and just trying to crash these systems. You know what I mean? It's just like China's going to try to crash our system. We're going to try to crash theirs and on and on and on. And then there'll be like maybe non-state actors who we don't even know who they are, who are going to get into the system and try to bring it down. It's overly complex. It's intrusive, it's invasive, and it's based in just utter science fiction fantasy. It cannot work. It can't work. So that's your light at the end of the tunnel. You know, how you want to get through the tunnel yourself, that's going to be up to you. But I'm just telling you right now, I mean, Gordon has been telling me this for years now. You know, it's like these plans cannot work. I mean, actually, I think when we did that show, you know, on COVID a year and a half ago now, you know, he's saying that, like, this stuff is not going to work. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. And just the fact that, you know, the people running it are just so old and senile. And that's another, <laughs> that's another reason. So, you know, in the meantime, simplify your life, cut your expenses, get ready to, you know, if you need to just bug out of your present situation, do so. You know, just get down to your core, you know, just be, become... You know, like a warrior, develop that kind of warrior mentality yeah. um, of a Ronin, let's say, <laughs> you know, be prepared to become a Ronin because you, you may have to in order to survive the collapse of the system. I mean, I hope we have a soft landing and maybe we will. I mean, maybe cooler heads will prevail and sensible people will say like, all right, let's just stop this this is not going to work you know let's just put these people in homes and get them away from the the computers and get back to like you know semi-normal living yeah but yeah i mean it's just not going to work it's they're going to be putting way too much stress on the internet on the infrastructure on the phone lines on the cable lines it's just too much going on and it's just not going to work just accept that and just again Get down to your basic core and realize that I genuinely believe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well said. And so many things are worse, but in terms of things that are better since we last spoke in March, journalists and advocates are definitely figuring some stuff out and growing some balls just outside of the mainstream. And mm -hmm. that is a beautiful thing. And we know the ritual never, ever ends, and that's not so bad, because I do love talking to you about the latest chapters of it, and let's leave people with a reminder about that new revised and expanded edition of The Endless American Midnight, and a pitch for the Patreon, because you do churn out a lot of really great stuff there. It is hard to keep up, but what should they know? What should they know about the Patreon? About supporting you in general, with the new book and the Patreon. They should know that it will be money well spent. It's an investment. It's an investment in your <laughs> in your future. It's an investment in your education. <laughs> no, we, we do do a lot of very interesting work on the Patreon, and I have just so much material that I've just been stockpiling up for it. And again, there's just so much going on. There's just so much to draw from the news every day. And it's a good group of people. I'm, I'm very pleased. I, I, I have very good fans that the people who I like, the people who I'd like to have a beer with, you know, they're not, 
they don't scare me. <laughs> you know? So that's a, that's a good thing too, you know? I mean, you want to feel like, you know, you're reaching people who are sensible, mature adults. And I can definitely tell from the group on that, you know, my patrons, that that is definitely the case. And that is extremely gratifying to me. Yes, I agree with that sentiment. Well, Chris, you are the man, obviously one of my favorite folks. Always a depressing pleasure, but take care out there. <laughs> A depressing pleasure. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, indeed. Revisiting the never-ending ritual with the Synchro Mystic Sage of the Secret Sun blog. Definitely one of my favorite THC guests of all time. Always a pleasure to have him back. And it's always fun presenting you, dear listener, with the latest layers of the conspiratorial Synchro Mystic cake. A lot of people still say the Song of the Siren episode we did is one of their favorite podcast episodes ever, and most of the ones we've done since then tie in in some way as well. And of course, his take on the Roswell working and Lucifer's technologies are also some of my favorite threads. But I knew we would most likely be a little all over the place here, so I wanted to make sure the first hour closed out with that last quote that I read. Deadly festivals, dead rappers, Luxor, and UFOs. Anyone sensing a pattern here? Because Chris really has picked up on something pretty specific and interesting, and it seems like some sort of ritual has repeated. And themes that shouldn't relate to each other do in this strange tapestry of tragedy. You might even remember the weird elements to the Stephen Paddock thing were that he worked for the NASA contractor that supposedly made the faulty O-ring for the Challenger. And there were reports that before he fired on the crowd, supposedly, there were shots fired at a Janet airplane. Janet Air, you know, the unmarked airline that takes people to their jobs at Area 51. Just another non-existent terminal, as they say. I don't know. I'm not 100% on if those are vetted elements of the story, because it is so hard to know what's real anymore. But it's odd that we get movement on official government UFO operations right after these strange strings of events. Good eye on Chris for finding this pattern, because it is so weird. Funny, at one point in the second hour, we were talking about Robert Anton Wilson. I was trying to think of the name of the book I was referring to, and I think I said Serious Rising. But the book I was referencing is actually Cosmic Trigger, though he did write Prometheus Rising, <laughs> which is a hit for today. And in the description of the book, Robert Anton Wilson says, We are all giants raised by pygmies who have learned to walk with a perpetual mental crouch. Unleashing our full stature, our total brain power, is what this book is all about. And I just found it funny that in the one-sentence description, of course he mentions giants. Out of all the infinite things he could have said. But I also just wanted to end this wrap-up relaying Noel's laws to you once again. They are the foundation of a lot of his work these days, and they're very dependable. I meant to spell them out in the interview early on, and I don't think we got to it, so just for your context, Noel's first law is whenever a controversy over symbolism erupts in the media, it's usually disguising a completely different symbolic message altogether. Noel's second law is the old blood sacrifice state cults will be reestablished under the cover of woke. And his third law is, the old statues currently being torn down will eventually be replaced by the icons and idols of the new old state cult. And that third law in particular was something we were kind of pointing out examples of when it comes to, like, the Confederate statue being taken down in Dallas and replaced with a squid-headed thing. Whatever that is, but it's perfect for a Chris Knowles blog post, for sure. He also had a really great expose on the civil courts building of the 22nd Judicial Circuit in downtown St. Louis and its Mithraic symbolism, an analysis and symbolic breakdown that is very deep and also leads to other buildings having the same structure, City Hall in LA, the Indiana War Memorial, a government building in Tokyo, and the Scottish Rite Temple in Washington, D.C., just to name a few. We didn't get time to add that to the stack, and 
you might have noticed that a lot of THC interviews have sounded quite good compared to how they used to sound. I actually think it was the last time Chris was here that we had so many issues with Skype, I just had had it. And I started testing out other recording software, and I settled on what I use now. And it's really great, because even if we have breakups in our connection, the audio is still recorded perfectly and then sent to me later. So you might have noticed in the last show, and I think towards the end of this one, I mentioned uh, you were kind of breaking up there, but to your ears, you hear everything they said. So it's kind of good, because I can edit around any kind of breakups and still have all the words they said captured, and they all sound better. So... It's a win-win, <laughs> I guess. But it does make for navigating those breakups a little difficult for me. But whatever, we make it work, and it's much better than Skype or Zoom. But as for Knowles' laws, I find those to be very dependable for parsing what's going on out there and what's coming. I appreciate his critique on Satanism. Satanism researchers are still good at picking up a lot of details, even if it really is about Mithras. But it's just good to have watchdogs out there sniffing out stuff that is not necessarily organic and symbolism that definitely seems seeded. I hope we didn't do the three degrees of Jack Parsons and Ghislaine Maxwell before, but it is hard to keep up with the tapestry of connections that Chris goes through. Maybe we did talk about it before, but it is worth a re-mention. Because that is nuts, isn't it? It's a small world and we are just... Locked out of it. <laughs> of course, he also makes great points about technology, and also, who's even asking for the metaverse? Who wants to have some pixelated Nintendo Wii-like avatar in a virtual Zoom room when you can just be on Zoom in video? Like, what value does it add? Really none, and I tend to think the elite are just trying to dazzle us with the shallow, empty, fallen angel-inspired technology because it distracts us away from life, from nature, and the great creation, we could say. Think about a jealous high school ex who will go to some serious lengths to recapture your attention, even if it's just for a fight, even if it's negative attention. You know, when people are jealous, they don't want to see you happy, so they meddle. They turn up their best efforts for the short term just to say once, See, for better or worse, it doesn't matter. I still got your attention. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I've had those exes. I've actually probably been that ex at times as well. Not proud of it, but here we are. I think the fallen angels feel like if they can just get us hooked on vices and addictions and really anything that takes attention away from our short life in this creation, they feel like that's a win. I say it all the time, but I think even the paper chase itself fits into that category. But the metaverse seems like it is structured to be the ultimate time suck, a fully immersive digital world for us to waste as much time in as they can get us to. For the people who heard the full episode last week, I think I said it was a pacifier for the life of poverty that they have planned for us, and I think that's true. So stay awake, be ready, <laughs> and brace yourself, because it's all coming. Big thanks to Chris, as always. He is one of a kind. In the second hour, we talked about the age-old question of if Lovecraft was an intelligence asset for the sorcerarchy. We got deeper into the Mithraic metaverse, technology's broken promises, Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson, the awkwardness of the scientism frontmen, dick rockets and cosmic courtship, the Chinese moon rover and the black cube, PJ Harvey, Jeff Buckley, and the dueling sirens, the Kardashian coven, destroyer of men, the real details of how Liz Frazier and Travis Scott are connected through the weekend as well as Tiger King 2 and the Country Fried Epstein. Anyone who watched Tiger King 2 will notice it gets really weird as they dance around what sounds like child trafficking. Glad Chris picked up on that on the blog, and I was able to ask him about it today. 
So you missed a lot if you only hear the first free hour. The full two-hour plus show always adds so much more. I remain committed to staying ad-free, and I just ask that if you like the first hour, you treat us both and sign up for the full episodes. You can listen on most apps with the dedicated Plus RSS feed, get access to the forums, comments, and download all the THC music, as well as get a discount code for the Higher Side store. Eight bucks a month, comb through many years of archives, and cancel any time. And to all the members, your subscription is much appreciated. I couldn't do it without you. As for Higher Side meetups, the next five on the calendar are Phoenix, Portland, Joplin, Missouri, Raleigh, North Carolina, and New York City. Check the calendar at HigherSideMeetups.com for details, and if you want to find the others in your area, making your own meetup is super easy too. Don't be shy. Other than that, I'm just looking for more voicemails for the next joint session. It's coming. I want to hear how it's going for you guys out there. Let me know. But as for me, I guess that's it. Always follow along with Chris at secretsun.blogspot.com. His Patreon has more content than any other I've been a part of. And I guess I'm getting out of here. Enjoy the holiday. I've done my part. Your move, ritual writers, woke virus spreaders, and secret keepers of the sorcerarchy. Your fucking move. When you see weird lights outside of your door. Something sits on your chest when you sleep It might be a pattern you've been through before Mm -hmm. Oh, you might have those screen memories Darling, wait till we get some proof It's getting just 